Excellent. All right. So what I thought would be useful now is uh, to share a demonstration with you, just so you can get, because this is one of those picture worth a thousand words kind of things, where I could describe this to you all day, and you'd sit there and shake your head. Um, you'd probably go to sleep. Um, so I'll, I'll show you what it looks like. And what we, we provide is there's two different interfaces we present to the customer, and they're for different audiences. So one is a dashboard. Um, again, it's that previous comment about senior executives and dashboards, that's still fairly true. So the dashboard is really for the senior executives. So our customers, the CFO and the controllers, tend to look at these things periodically. Um, there's also some program management capability. And when we say program management, that means the case management. So making sure that issues are being resolved, that they're being followed up, that, that people aren't overloaded from a, a, you know, an allocation of labor perspective. And then the workbench is really, this is our proprietary interface. And this is where we enable people to quickly understand what happened. So again, not, they're not doing a lot of heavy lifting. They're not doing a lot of analytics. The system has done that. They look at the results. They, they you know, see what we've identified, um, determine what the next steps are, and then, and then that action, those next steps, are, are enabled from within the, the interface. So again, going back to the you know, information without the ability to act on it is fairly useless. We want them to be able to go, ah, I know exactly what I want to do, and I'm going to right click here, and I'm going to send an email, and, and I'm going to go here and, and make a note and all that kind of stuff. So it's all integrated. Um, and we'll spend most of the time in the workbench, and then I'll show you the dashboard after I show you the workbench. Okay. So, <clears throat> so first notice this is a browser. So it's not rocket science. I'm going to maximize it. Um, and then sign in here. And <coughs> so we've signed in here. Let's stretch this a little bit. Um, can you see that? Oh, that's not. All right. That's not going to do, is it? Hold on, let me. Yeah, it's it's just the it's the display properties are a little bit different between. Okay, <coughs> so this is the oversight workbench. <coughs> We've the main way that we help our customers drive th their work in this is through what we call profiles. So you can see profiles here. Um, this functionality came out of work with KPMG about eight years ago. Um, okay. Oh, that's the that's you. Okay. So, um, and what we found is that. After you run the analytics, and the way our analytics work, you start with what's called an indicator. And an indicator is an individual test. So you guys were doing ACL. You can think of an indicator being fairly analogous to an ACL script. But you can run dozens and dozens of these indicator tests against the same data to highlight different issues. And then using profiles, you can build sort of save searches to identify patterns or, or sets of those indicators to identify places that are the highest risk. So again, to help drive the focus on where do I spend my time in this interface. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll just step through some of these, and hopefully this will make more sense. Um, so we provide these out of the box. So things like this is a set of, of global profiles. Um, this is for our travel and expense fraud risk review. Okay, So this is a demo system. This is all real customer data that we've, we've changed names and sanitized company names out. But these are all real transactions, just if you're wondering. Um, in uh, in a, a corporate or in a, every credit card transaction has something called an MCC related to it. <coughs> Some there's another numbering system called an SIC, but an MCC stands for Merchant Category Code, and that is when you're a company applying to take credit cards, you tell the credit card company what you are, right? So you say, I'm a restaurant, I'm a convenience store, I'm a bank, right? I'm a office supply store. One thing, this might not surprise you, that there is one for gentlemen's clubs. 
I don't think any gentlemen's clubs use that actual code because they want the corporate spender to be able to do this. So they will call themselves restaurants or maybe, maybe a bar, but usually they show up as restaurants from what I'm told. Um, one of the things that we do for those is they also change their names and they change the, the category codes. Um, so for gentlemen's clubs, we actually keep track of a list of physical addresses as well because it's hard for them to move. It's a lot easier for them to change these things. But just you can think of the MCC as uh, that category. So um, what we do is for this specific, when we're looking for what we call fraud and, and um, misuse, we have the list of all those MCC codes, and there's several hundred of them. And we have the customer go through and say, what is high risk for them? So what Siemens can do, say, Apple might not be able to do because of the nature of the business. Right? So they may say, look, um, there's one for plumbing, for instance, for plumbers. So one of our customers is HD Supply, which used to be part of Home Depot. Right? They, they are an industrial or a commercial uh, building man materials uh, sales organization. So for them, they say, look, plumbing, yeah, P people do that all the time. But if you have a, a, like a technology business where you don't expect plumbing, then you, you would flag that as high risk. So they go through and flag those things, uh, and we use that as input into the analytics. Um, and then the, the, the other step I mentioned we call an exclusion, which is where you say, okay, I've said plumbing generally is, is not allowed. We'll flag all the plumbing transactions or all the patterns based on the level of severity. And then if, say, Rod's allowed to buy plumbing because of his role, then you can explicitly tell oversight, so train it to ignore him. So let him do that. We call that an exclusion, and I'll show you how that works. Um, bless you. <clears throat> so if I click here on MCC summary, then you can see this brings up by, and let me try. Let me see if I can change the display really quickly because it's Let's see if this makes it easier to see. It gives a little more real estate to work with here. Is that actually, can you see this on the left side? Okay, so <clears throat> what you can see here is the list of, these are the merchant category codes, the number of exceptions, so we're generating exceptions, right? We're telling you when the things that have happened you don't expect have, have occurred, and then we do a summarization of what we call potential impact, uh, which is converted into one currency. So this is a U.S. system that's based on dollars, but companies spend money in lots of different currencies, so you have to automate that process. Um, or you should be automating that process. Um, and so what we've come into is this is a list of the merchant category codes that the company has said, hey, these are high risk. So if you see anything in one of these, any individual transaction, tell me about it. Okay? And so you have a summary by, and you can see record stores, welding services, um, and then you can see the individual examples down here, and you can, I think I probably referenced some of these iTunes store purchases. Um, just to give you an idea of, of what this looks like. Um, and then I'll go into a good place to start. Here's high risk transactions. And so what we provide here is a set of you know, what we call profiles. And these are pre-configured based on best practices. Um, but what this says is rare expense type and merchant category code on a weekend. So in this case, we're also doing statistics to say when are these things, not, you know, when do people buy from this type of business or do we buy from this type of business and change the risk weighting accordingly. And then um, we also do a pairing analysis. So if you think of it this way, so I, I have my credit card. I go and I buy something with a credit card. Then I have to go into an expense reporting system and say what I did, right? So uh, say I see jewelry stores, right? Well, a lot of our customers allow a certain subset of employees to buy at jewelry stores, and that would be, say, a service award. So, you know, you've worked here 20 years, I'm going to buy you a watch, right? So we expect that jewelry store purchase to be called an employee service award. Well, we'll see ones that are called office supplies. Okay, that's statistically an anomaly, and we'll, we'll flag that, or, or miscellaneous. And, and those types of things happen all the time, 
And then the manager looking at it, to, to back to your question before, the manager looking at it might say, oh, that's a miscellaneous, 50 bucks, whatever, I don't care. Even though if, you, if they dug in, then they would see that it was actually you know, a, a, a nice piece of, well, it's 50 bucks, so you're not gonna get that, anything that nice, but you, know, you might have a $50 transaction that is, is otherwise, or it is not appropriate. Okay. So you click on here, this really is, is designed to find the low-hanging fruit. And so you can see, <coughs> from a, a, an information layout perspective, this is also designed to look like Microsoft Outlook. So from this view, so you can see, you got your navigation, I've got an inbox concept here and a, a preview pane. And that also helps the user shorten the learning curve because it's very familiar. They go, oh, okay, I know, I'm, I'm used to this layout. Um, so just like an email, I can double click one of these to, actually before I do that. so. <coughs> First, we, each of these is a, an individual exception. So because this is fraud risk, this is one transaction. So I'll get into misuse, which would meet a pattern. Um, but you have key details like who did it, you know, who, where, they, where they spent the money, uh, what that merchant category code is that I mentioned, that, that four-digit number, and then how they expensed it. So this is how they put it in their t and &E system. Um, the value and converted back to dollars. And then there's two scores here, the priority and confidence. I mentioned those indicators before, and we think of indicators as like a tripwire, so think of it as, as a test that's failed, or a piece of evidence. Um, and it, underlying it's called evidential reasoning, but that's where it's like, how many pieces of evidence do I have that this thing's a real issue? Um, and each of those has a score that add up to give you confidence. So the confidence is low, medium, high. Green means high confidence in the finding, not like this is a really good thing that happened. Um, and I try to explain that to my engineers, and they're like, yeah, it's green. You're like, Green's like the wrong color. But the other one's orange and red and yellow. Okay. So it's my, my, my personal fight. Um, and then what the priority does is gives you the confidence with a, a um, it multiplies it by the impact. And the impact is the typically transaction value. So priority gives you like a financial risk weighting, if that makes sense. So it gives you just two different ways to prioritize it. Did you have a question? Mm hmm Okay. Well, it, or it's not. It's, it's it's low, medium, high. So it means. So I'll show you. So each each of these, there's there is some science behind this. Um, down here. So these these are indicators. So these are tests that have failed. So we've said that this is a high risk merchant category based on what the customer told us, and it was made on a weekend. And so this is going to increase the risk because we find that t and &E transactions made on weekends are higher risk. They're not wrong necessarily, but the fact it was at a high risk. And But we also see that this particular merchant category code, so theatrical producers, is frequently used, so we'll reduce the risk a little bit. But even with that taken into account, it's still high, this, this confidence is, is high because it's still high risk based on the other indicators. Does that make sense? So I'll open this exception. And then this is, this is the person doing this work is, again, that person sitting in financial operations. So they may be uh, in a shared service center. They may be, you know, they may work for another company. Um, but it's the person who's tasked with, with going through these results. And let me, I'm still not happy with this projector. Let's make it a little easier to see. Is that, okay. And also, so, when you see a lot of the other solutions that are out there, so for reporting or analysis, the, the outputs of those systems tend to be either like an online list of reports or most commonly we see a spreadsheet. So the, the person who receives it has to go and do a lot of work to figure out what, what's in there, what, what it's telling them. Um, where in this case, we've done a lot of work. We, we can tell you exactly what we found and put it in clear, plain language and, and in the, the, the user's language. So um, you know, in this case, we can tell you this, you know, this is a car transaction at the Cowboys Stadium, may, valid, uh, may violate company's travel policy. And there's a, a link to Google here, so you can see if you don't know who this is, Cowboys Stadium, right? Um, that's pretty, pretty easy to decipher, but for ones that are less clear, you know, it's nice to have the link, just to save the step. Uh, any Cowboys fans here? All right, so 
full disclosure, I grew up uh, in D.C., so I, uh, I think this one probably should be like, you should be able to be terminated just for... <laughs> All right. Um, so it's been, a, it's been a tough stretch, though, right? Love it. Hey, it's coming from a Redskins fan, so... <laughs> yeah, it's been a tough stretch, too. All right. Um, so <clears throat> we also give you key, key details of the transaction. So who did it, when, the, the transaction currency and amount, what that converts back to dollars if it's a different currency, uh, then how they expensed it and how they described it. So you know, the thing is that, and what we're telling you here is with, with the different pieces of evidence, right, we're telling you that Tyrus, based on the, the, the company, has said, look, tell me when any, whenever anybody buys something at a theatrical producer, tell me, because you know, I'm, I'm probably okay with it, I'm probably entertaining customers, but I want to look at it and make sure I know that, right? But made on a weekend, that's probably not that big a deal in this case. Um, and this is more frequently used, right, lower risk, but this last one tells us that the expense type is rarely used for MCC. So that's that pairing. So statistically, why are you telling me that this is a hotel, right? And that's, that's you know, it's, it's high risk, but you're also telling me this is a hotel. And this is pretty clearly not a hotel. So again, it's, and again, we don't make, we don't make decisions. We don't make determinations. This is just what was in the data. And, and again, this, this was, uh, and you see it's 331 bucks. That's not that much for an NFL game, that's, you know, a, a couple of tickets, um, maybe one ticket, but again, you can see that this is different enough to be worth looking at. Question? Or? Um, <clears throat> so the next thing most people want to see is, they want to see the details, right? So what, what's going on here? So I want to go look at the transactions, and if you click entities, I, I described the common data model before. So we use the word entities to describe the tables in the common data model, so you can just think of that as you know, I got a, you know, a credit card transaction, I've got an expense report line, those are entities, and those are the data that's related to this exception. Um, so there's a lot going on here, uh, but you can see here, this is the credit card transaction, this is the expense report detail, so this came out of whatever system they're using, they may be, you know, Oracle has a product, SAP has a product, um, there's something called Concur, which is a cloud-based application, so if you've ever, a lot of companies use their own, but this came out of that system. Um, and you can compare in between the two. Um, there's, if there are other transactions, and I'll show you if there's a pattern, those will be displayed here. Uh, and then you also have a view to the employee. So if you open this, you can see this is Gerald Mood. And one of the, the keys that we're trying to help our customers do is, is get out of the weeds. So I talked to a, com a, a, pro a prospective customer about three weeks ago, and they're running a system called Concur. Now this is a global, probably 500 company. And they said, yeah, we, we, I asked you earlier what rule, if you knew what rules are, right? So they said, yes, we put audit rules into Concur. Okay, that's great. So, so how's that going? Well, we generate between five and 6,000 flags a month. Okay, and, and how's that going? Well, we try to get through half of them. Well, they have five or 6,000 things that are saying, oh, this person spent more than $200 a night on a hotel. And, they, and again, it's just, it's noise, right? They, it's spitting out a, you know, an online report that they kind of scroll through when they have time, but they're, they're not getting anything out of it. So again, what we're trying to help you do is not only find the individual transactions that really need that attention, but then also correlate that back to the, the participant, right? So again, these tickets didn't buy themselves, right? Somebody bought these tickets. I hope the Cowboys lost. <laughs> All right, I'll stop. Um, but w you want to be able to see what this person's doing. So if you click this widget here, We've actually we keep track of this automatically. So when an exception is generated, it it is allocated to that employee, and not just the exception, but also the score, right? So you, that risk scoring, that priority confidence, that gets allocated to the employee as well. So the person reviewing this goes, hey, is this you know did this person just accidentally hit hotels when they submitted this, or is this is there a pattern here? So you click open a new window, and this brings your your person record. We call it person, just HR employee record, right? And then you can see he's got scoring related to him, and he's got a, a, an impact, and this, this dollar amount is bigger than the, um, the value of that exception. And then if you click exceptions, you can see there's just one. So <coughs> this is the first thing he's done. I don't know what we'll see. So there must have been something else. Th th that impact was generated on, on something else that was dismissed. So apologies for that. Um, but again, you can see this, you know, he's, he is, 
only has this one exception, and I'll show you another example in a minute where there's you know a, a significant pattern. Um, but you can see that you know this maybe this was a mistake, maybe this is the first time you did it. Um, but we're certainly going to follow up with him and ask. But you know it, the the response or how you manage and handle what you do with this is different based on you know the level of severity. You can also look at everything else that that he's done just from a transaction perspective. So if you click show related entities, this actually opens up the person and all these other types of data related to them. So if you wanted to see their card, for instance, um, you wanted to look at the actual individual credit card transactions. And this 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 might not happen with the, the connection, but um, if you will envision, you would see a list of all the card transactions. Um, and what it'll let you do is, if you'll, you'll see ones with a priority, so see this one, like this card, yeah, it's not gonna, I don't think it's gonna work. But this, see, there's no priority. So that that's a, in this case, a card without a, an exception related to it. So you can see all the transactions listed, and you can sort them by priority, and then often you'll see, hey, here are ones that, you know, they weren't picked up by an exception, but because I'm looking at this person's activity, I might want to take a closer look. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so I'm, I'm going to, yeah, so it's, it's taking too long. So um, anyway, so that, that's how the user will go through the, the exception entities tab. Um, these next three tabs, so notes, log, and attachments, are focused on the, the workflow, the case management aspects. So, so there's notes here. I can say, you know, reviewed, and I'm not going to make you guys watch me type too much, uh, and require additional information. Right. So, if I anything I save there goes into this log, and from an evidence perspective or a documentation of control, this is critical. So there's not much here. This just the more or less has been generated, but any status changes, any ownership changes, um, any uh, emails that go out or, or are received, all that gets written into this log, and then you can't change it. You can add to it, but you can't update it, so it becomes like an untamperable audit log, if you will. And then any, any documents that are attached, you attach those here. Okay? Then from a, a workflow perspective, so what, what do I do next? All you have to do is right click here, because at this point we want more information from this guy, right? We want to say, hey, why why did you buy tickets and call it hotels? Is that just incorrectly expensed? You, you know, did you make a mistake? And all you have to do is click send exception. This ties into our company's email system, our customer's email system, uh, and you can see it's template driven. So the company, during the, the setup, they set up different uh, templates. They put in the language that they want. They usually work with their legal and corporate communication teams to get exactly what they want to say, exactly the information they want to communicate. And then you can automatically send this email out. Um, down here, you, you click send. And then if you need to attach any documents, like a travel policy or that sort of thing, um, that's all done here. So it's all sort of within, uh, within the, the interface. And then behind the scenes, there's a, a workflow engine with an escalation component running. Yep. Uh, they say what? They, they did? Yeah. Oh. I love I love the internet. Um, <coughs> it's okay. It's, I, I I still remember the the, the it was Aikman's first season when they went one in fifteen, and that was the Redskins that won. What, what's that? Mm, nah. I think I think I blocked those out. <laughs> um, now the giant. All right. Okay. Um, so, so there's a, an escalation engine that runs in the background, and what it lets you do is enforce the follow-up, right? But in an automated fashion. So, say I send Gerald an email, and a couple days later he hasn't responded, <coughs> and in the in the email I say, hey, the, the policy is I need a response in in two business days. Then you can set an, an automated reminder that just will email him again and say, okay, we haven't heard back from you. Why? And then. I mean, we've talked to one company, they, their plan is to escalate it eventually to the CFO. So they say, look, if you don't respond in three days, it goes up a level, up a level, up a level, and it keeps going until it gets to the CFO, and then you're going to have to explain it to, to him directly why you didn't respond to this. So 
it, that has never happened. They don't expect it to happen. But it's one of those, you know, you, if you are very clear about your expectation of behavior, then, then that will drive that behavior. So let me show you a, an example here under what we call uh, policy misuse. So this is a little bit different view. Uh, and again, when we call it misuse, by definition, we're only going to find things that are, are a pattern. right? So either a number of transactions, a threshold was exceeded, or a dollar threshold. Um, and so this, so just to open one of these, let me So, and so again, th this is a real example from one of our customers, um, and we're calling it policy misuse. Again, very similar, very you know, easy to read, and all this language is pre-configured. So, car transaction at Publix, um, the employee date, all those sorts of things. You know, he called it meals, and a, a lot of customers. And if you if you ever travel, like a lot of grocery stores, you can buy a sub, right? So you may say, like, you don't have Publix up here, but Publix is a big grocery store, um, and you know they have like nice subs, and you can go get an eight dollar sub. So if if that happens, that's fine, right? If it happens once or twice, you know, even four or five times, um, we we don't we simply don't care, right? We that's acceptable, and they're calling it meals, and it's below a certain threshold. So this one transaction wouldn't set off anybody's warning radar at all, right? It's a forty four dollar trans. Okay, fine. Um, what makes this interesting is that this is part of a pattern. And you can see that the indicators here tell us that this is medium risk. Again, the company told us this is medium risk, meaning don't tell me if it ha every time it happens, like with high risk, but tell me if you see a pattern. So in this case, we see 10 other purchases for $259 other dollars within the past 30 days. Uh, and then it was also made on a weekend. So again, that, you know, but again, it's a $44 transaction. Yeah. Right, not as it's really it's not as urgent. So the, it, that that in this case the, the confidence is largely driven off that first indicator. So because it's medium versus high risk. So you're telling us even even we see. But if you had and it's not that many dollars. Even the whole pattern is what two hundred and more right. roughly three hundred bucks. So at the end of the day, it's still you know the question about is it material? It's not material, but it still it, it indicates a pattern of behavior, and we need to understand it. Um, so to go through some of the workflow stuff here, so there's an owner here. This is pretty standard. You, if I save it, it gets assigned to that person. They get notified. That can be done automatically as well. Um, then the status here is controlled by the workflow engine as well. Um, so there, there are a couple things I'll show you. So first, if I say closed findings, so this means that I went to the person <coughs> and they said, yeah, I kind of had to buy some groceries on the corporate card. This, that's actually what happened here was that the person was doing their personal shopping. Um, so you go close finding and then you, do, you go to reason code. Right? Reason code allows the oversight user to say why this happened. Right? So this is root cause. Right? So what, what, what was the underlying issue that, that created this exception? And what we'll do is we'll take this information, we'll push it into a dashboard so the company can go look at do root cause analysis. So if you've ever familiar, run into Lean Six Sigma, like th this exact same, you know, evaluate the process and, and you know, it's a continuous improvement cycle. <laughs> Compliance and, 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 I mean, business audit, yeah, I mean, a lot of different functions. Compliance mostly uses it when it gets into things like Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, because um, we do help companies with that as well, so. Um, but so, in this case, I, you know, you say, if you say close finding, I'm going to require you to, to enter a reason code. And so this this is my personal favorite, accidental card use. I was talking to a couple of people at the break. Um, and, and this is one that, that uh, means, you know, I pulled out the wrong credit card out of my wallet, right? Well, McDonald's used to, we used to see a lot of these when it first went into place and before the numbers went down. And the thing is, if you look at the McDonald's corporate credit card, okay, it's red, and it has this huge golden arches on it. Right? I mean, it, it's really clear that that's a McDonald's card. You know, not every company has that. A lot of companies just have this, you know, where it is the same color as somebody's, you know, personal Bank of America card or whatever. Um, but that's one of the things that if I see a huge number of these accidental card uses, maybe I look to change the card, the physical card, right? Like, 
he's got a picture of his family on his credit card. So, I mean, just to make it something that's so easily identifiable that you're just not going to accidentally pull it out. Okay. Um, also, this, you know, the policy violation. So back to the, you know, the, the Coca-Cola Marriott example. The policy was wrong, or the policy not was wrong. It's not right or wrong, but the policy was out of alignment with the way that people behaved and people were traveling, and so it actually made no sense. It made more sense to change the policy, and, and that was a better business decision at the end of the day. Okay. So you, you have the ability to do that, and then. If, uh, if you send an email, this will automatically change to email sent. The, when an email is received, it is automatically captured, and then this would be changed to email received, so then you can create notifications there. Again, that just all, all these things are to help streamline the follow-up process, to take the burden off of the person. And it's really hard to follow up on a spreadsheet, right? How many times that you, so you take that out of your hands. And then one more thing I'll show you here is, again, that, that, that concept we call exclusions. Um, and again, exclusion is a great example. So uh, one of our customers is a, a, a large university in, in California. And we found this exact thing, like identical, set of grocery stores and supermarkets, and it was on one cardholder, thousands of dollars. And then the same cardholder, she also had hundreds of dollars of daycare expenses. And you're going, what's that? And they started laughing. They said, oh, yeah, she runs the university daycare. So she's allowed to buy, she's buying snacks for the kids. She, you know, it's several hundred dollars a week. And when, you know, when she's short staffed, she can hire daycare professionals from, you know, the, the area, and that's where that comes from. So, you know what, this, in that case, is a false positive. So, again, false positive, I, I'm telling you something's a problem when it's not. And when you're an, annex, an analytic solution, false positives are the devil, right? That's the worst possible thing I can do is tell you a bunch of things that aren't true issues. And so when we were talking earlier about, you know, if I miss one thing, if, you know, that duplicate, I'd rather miss it but still catch 80% of what you're doing rather than tell you of an extra 50% of stuff that isn't real. And this one we know for a fact is not real or not a true issue in that case where it's legit, right? So what I would say is you can then choose the type of exclusion you want. So I can say this one person can shop at this one MCC code. So the next time Frederick Butner, again, you can tell that name has been changed, um, next time he shops at a grocery store, just ignore it. And what it'll do is any exceptions that are already out here will be dismissed. So you don't delete exceptions, but they'll be hidden from the user. And then it will it'll train the analytic to go, OK, he's fine. He's allowed to do this. There is an approval process around that. And it's there. You can undo that as well. So you can say, okay, this now his roles changed. Now he's not allowed to shop at grocery stores anymore. That's easy to do as well. But allow that allows you to really fine tune it to focus the customer on exactly where the risk is, on exactly what they need to look at. So again, so that's sort of the two-step process of tuning it with the parameters and then tuning it with the exclusions. And you can do things like the you know the individual merchant. So you know, I want my my employee service awards only bought it. Tiffany on one individual Tiffany location, because I, I have a relationship there, then that one will be okay. But if they go to even another Tiffany, that, that wouldn't be, or it would still be picked up. It would be flagged. So we're not stopping transactions here. Um, but this gives them, a, the customer, a, you know, a second step of way to really finely tune it. Okay. So then going to the entities tab again here, this, this looks similar. I just want to show you this. So notice that because we're telling you there's a pattern here, so there's 10 other transactions in the pattern, here are those other 10 transactions. And notice they're not all, you know, they're, they're not big dollars. They are pretty close together in dates, the 18th, the 22nd, the 25th, you know. Um, and, and again, this person was doing their personal shopping and they thought that, hey, if I, I break it down into a lot of little transactions, they'll never know. They'll never find it. And, and again, the customer said, look, if you, it, we would have never noticed this ever. Because even if we sampled these, we would say, eh, $22, you know, it's below the receipt limit. You know, most of these are below the receipt limit. In this case, this company's 25 bucks. So I'm not even going to have anything to look at if I do audit this. So it's just by, again, pull you out of the weeds, get you up a, a, a different level of data so that you're looking at people and behaviors rather than individual transactions, right? The, the five to 6,000 flags a month issue. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll go through a 
a couple more examples here. So you have um, what we call T and E duplicate review, <clears throat> and so this is interesting. We this seems to be a company by company problem, meaning some companies it just doesn't happen, and some companies it's there's there's pockets of it, um, and I mean we've seen where. You know, the, the most common is two people have a meal together, one swipes the card and hands the receipt to the other person, and then the other person submits it. Or actually, sorry, the most common is actually when that same person, they, they put it on the card, and then three months later they submit it. And those things are just hard to find. So we, we look across about a year's worth of activity across all employees to especially see if people are doing that one where they, you know, they swap it. Um, and we've seen people give each other hotel statements that they've already expensed, and then again with with you know new systems like Concur, like when I do an expense report, I have an app on my phone. I take a picture of the receipt. It goes into Concur. I don't even need a receipt. I could I could reuse that receipt 20 times. Um, so this helps target those things. Uh, and and same thing where, where we say you know same same employee, one cash, one credit on different expense reports, and we find that's that's the highest risk scenario, and, and the most common that we find issues. So, we look at one of these. You can see, you know, this is a, a Southwest Airlines ticket, right? And so you can see that, w and this, this, this also, there, there's a chance that this is a false positive if there happened to be another $430.40 transaction on the same date. Um, but in this case, you know, different expense reports, same employee, different merchants, same transaction amount. One's out of pocket, one's not. Airfare, and then you know he called it miscellaneous. So. Um, it just, again, this, this might be acceptable, this might be a false positive, but it's worth reviewing and worth, worth double checking. Um, one of our customers found uh, a guy who traveled from Amsterdam to Houston on KLM. He had, it was $4,200, so it was a business class ticket. One was on his credit card, and then he had three out of pockets for $4,200, and he called each of those airline fees on KLM. And so they asked him what the fees were, and the fees were, were actually the fees for his wife and his two kids to fly on the same flight. So he was just trying to kind of sneak it under, and you're going, well, that's, that's $12,000 plane tickets. Like, you just, you just, I mean, people do this stuff all the time, and it's absolutely shocking. So I think that was, yeah, I accidentally put that receipt in. We also do, um, so we, we, we look at out-of-pocket spending, uh, and there's two ways we look at it. So one is, look, we, we ask for receipt limits, so we look for patterns of spending right below those receipt limits, because I don't need a receipt. One of our customers found a guy, he had a $24.99 lunch every day for like six consecutive months, weekends included. You're like, so you're like, be a better fraudster, please. I mean, just. But and we find a lot, you know, where it's it's 20, 22, 20, 23, 50. I mean, so patterns like that. Um, and then we also look for transactions that, you know, and this is one of those also company by company thing. So our customers all have a corporate card, like a corporate travel card, and they want to move that spend onto the, the corporate travel card. But some companies are like, yeah, they just have it. It's nice to have. We're not going to make it required. But then some companies say, hey, you know, we actually, you know, you're not going to get reimbursed if you don't use the card. So what we see is the, oddly enough, the instances of fraud on out-of-pocket spend is way higher than if you're using the corporate card. Um, and so that's that's one place to focus. So, you know, again, like that example I just gave you about the airplane tickets um, came out of there. So, um, <coughs> so if we just dig into one of these, this is out-of-pocket review. So all, all around amount and receipt. Slowing down, maybe the connection's slowing, but um, come on. All right, we'll see if this one will work. Um, it was working really well. All right, here we go. Okay, so. So that's that's a trend. So first is the, you know all round amount and receipts. There's none in there. Okay, um, but this is a, this is one where it looks like they're trying to circumvent the ex the expense limit or the receipt limit, and so you can see 
And this guy, he's got $24.90 transactions um, for meals, and there's you know, eight others in the prior 30 days. So it's exactly the same thing. So nine times he's put in a receipt or a transaction right below the receipt limit. So, um, and then, so out of pocket policy. So oh, there's nothing in here. So here we go. Um, let's see which one I'm going to show you here. Yeah, and so so this one just the <coughs> um, out of pocket policy just looks at things like really high dollar transactions. So you know this is you know other miscellaneous. It's more than 200 bucks. I expect this one to be on an expense or on a on a card. You know, any transaction that's seventy two hundred dollars, I expect to be on a corporate card. And then this all insight. So <coughs> again, this is this is one of the main ways that our customers will use this is they'll come in and say, okay, take take me out of the, the, the those are individual high risk exceptions. So they typically will look at a handful of those. But this is where it starts to get interesting, and they say, okay, here are all my employees summarized by exceptions. And you can also sort this by potential impact, uh, which you can see in this system I've got, it's a demo system, I've got 84 people in here, um, with exceptions, that is. And this is going to help me really focus and, and prioritize this work. So I can go by exceptions, I can go by potential impact, um, and different folks come up here. So you can see, you know, this, this person's buying all sorts of you know, theatrical production, productions as well. But this is a $30,000 expense. Um, and it might be, again, it might be acceptable. We might want to put an exclusion, but in this case, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of dollars. Um, if you go back to the number here, sort of the other way, And you hear this guy, Jared Scroggs, you can see these are all suspicious out of pocket. And notice that you know he's got a $369 hotel stay, again, that you would expect on the card. So just I mean, at this, you get the that employee level perspective though, rather than digging through each individual issue. Okay, so that's an overview of the workbench. Does any at least give you an idea for how it works and how the company may use it? Okay. Um, I'll show you the the, the dashboard now. And this is summarized from the data that's in the workbench. Uh, and so really, it's to help drive visibility to what's going on in the data, as well as help focus the audit activities. Uh, and, and the internal audit team will often use this to help highlight and pinpoint areas of risk. So whether it's by geography like this one, or whether it's by the organization like this pie chart. Um, but you've got a set of tabs here. You've got a set of filters if you want to reduce the, the scope of what you're looking at, um, especially if you, like, once we've gone through it and they've said this is a, a true issue, you can filter that down in exception status, you would have a closed finding that status we saw earlier. Again, this is a demo system, so it's not, not populated. Um, you've got a couple of charts here. So this is a heat map just by geography. So you can see top states by exception spend. Uh, and this, this supports multinational. There's no, there's no multinational data in this one, so country doesn't show up, but it does support it. Uh, and then this is a more of an organizational risk chart. So you can see that region one has the highest dollars of exceptions. You can drill in here really easily and see, okay, where is this risk within this, this particular region? Sort this by amount. And we can see that department eight is the highest. So $62,000. Uh, again, drilling into department eight. We can get down to the group level and then drilling into group four, which is the highest dollars and exceptions, you get to the individual employees. So again, this helps, especially from an audit perspective, okay, um, so we're, we're talking to a, a reasonably well-known social media company, and what they've said is, look, we don't, we don't want to chase exceptions. We don't want to, we don't want a list of, of flags. We don't, we don't want to deal with any of that. What we want you to do is help us, because we found that, that all of the misbehavior or all of the, the non-compliance is very, it's, it's very narrow. It's in a very narrow set of people. So on a monthly basis, all we want you to do is help us find the top five people that we need to go have a talk with, whether it's change behavior, whether it's you know, escort them out. But that, there's, that's all we want, five people. So don't give me exceptions. Just give me this list, right, across the, or the, the list that we just looked at on the workbench. Just help me focus that activity because 
you know, the, the bang for the buck that we'll get for that will be you know, many times the value. Just a comment. Remember we saw in EMY when they made their presentation with IBM, they were doing some things where they just got rating employees risks over mm -hmm. this quarter. They were actually showing the employees what their risk profile is in terms of their performance in the computer and the other things. Mm -hmm. That's that's a great idea. We should the wall. Of, some some companies call it, they call it the wall of shame, and they will they'll talk about it. I mean, it, it's all cultural. But I, I don't think most companies can do that. But just um, and then th this this chart here is a, just a, a trend over time, so you can see what a trend over time is for. Which is w w are things improving? Communicate improvement. Are they getting worse? Help me focus. And things like, you know, there's a spike here. Why was there a spike? And, and look into it. Um, but again, helps you keep track of how things change over time. And this is looking at exception rates. So again, these go down fairly quickly um, as we as we see a customer use it. Um, these next three tabs are really summaries of the analytics results. So it allows our customers to do things like drill into if I look at the merchant category code, and you, you do look at groups, you can see this is just spend information, just consolidated. Um, but at the bottom here, you have that spend information cross-referenced with the exception information that we've generated. So it gives you that sort of that cross-reference. Um, you can see that airlines and hotels and motels don't have any exceptions. So again, it's useful to sort by things like exception rate. And this is this is a real customer example. We, I haven't changed the name of the merchant. Uh, you see high-risk personal services, um, which is interesting. So you drill into it, and we see it's a dating and escort service. And we can't we can't make this up. Um, you, you know, companies do have the ability to block codes, right? So they can say, don't you know, American Express, don't let my people use the card at at MCC code seven two seven three, and that's what they've done since this. Um, but somebody actually did put in a seventy one dollar fifty seven cent charge um, at the Golden VIP. So, again, maybe there's customer entertainment. I, we don't see how they actually classified it here, but I mean, most companies aren't going to be happy about that kind of thing, um, or at least you know, put it out of pocket at least and just submit a receipt out. Um, <coughs> so that's that's the MCC group. There's the merchant is is very similar, just by merchant. Um, so it drills down a little bit lower level of detail. Um, so I'll, I'll skip that one just quickly. And then uh, employee analysis. <coughs> this gives you top spending employees. A lot of companies will actually try and focus on that top spend. There's you know, the highest spenders. And they find what we find is pretty consistent that these people, their exception rates are tiny. So they tend to follow the rules. They know the rules. They travel all the time. They work you know, consistently with the travel team. Um, so again, by sorting by exception rate, is, is much more productive in, in where to focus the, the audit effort. And so you can see that you know, this, this woman, Glenda, she had you know, one out of the five transactions she performed uh, had an exception. Uh, you can see Deborah Barnum here, you know, two thirds of the dollars she spent generated an exception. So you know, it just gives you quick visibility. And again, if you need to filter, these same filters go. So you, you know, only show me true positives, that sort of thing. So then these last three tabs are really focused on, on workflow within the system. So there's a workflow tab. This just shows you where everything came from. So the status by insight, the, the status by owner. So this is just to help the program management keep track of, you know, are things sitting around, are they aging? You know, this one is, are, are too many things assigned to one person or another that they're not getting through them? Um, this root cause is, it, because this is a demo system, it's not populated. but all of those, if I said accidental card use or policy violation, that would feed this so you could see, again, those root causes for that continuous improvement capability. And then this summary here is a 12-month a rolling summary of what's happened month to month. So you can see, again, this was all run in, in March. 
um, but you'll see the number of exceptions generated in these go down consistently over month over month. Uh, and it just helps the, the customer get a view of you know, how is this working, that sort of thing. Um, and then same thing by owner, you know, are, are too many things assigned to somebody, are they not getting work? So, um, but it really fo helps them focus on the case management aspects of it. So any, any questions on this piece of it?